Okay, thanks for coming. Uh, this is um, uh, uh, a gallop through Somerset coal miners' history. Um, I, the, the talk changes every time I, I give it. Um, I'd much rather do it live, um, but uh, you know, here we are. And thanks, thanks for coming. And it's it's brilliant to see so many visitors uh, to what is a meeting of a mandate trade union council. About 25 years ago, a miner in Tower Colliery in South Wales, uh, we were having a pint in a pub um, in the Aberdare Valley. And he said uh, he'd had a few pints. Um, he wasn't drunk. Uh, he said, uh, Dave, what, what has to happen before your washing machine um, comes on? And I'd had a few pints. And I said, I press a switch. And he laughed. He says, that's what every... F-U-C-K-E-R says, actually, it's because people like me work 40 hours a week underground digging coal. And I've never forgotten that. And, uh, you know, right up until the mid-1990s, 80% of all the energy uh, and electricity in this country was mined by coal. That's something that's often forgotten long after the miners' strike, for at least 10 years after the miners' strike. The vast majority of electricity generation in this country came from coal, privatized coal and imported coal. And up until September 1973, when the uh, joined underground pits of Rivington and Kilmerston um, near Radstock shut, Somerset coal miners for 200 years dug coal in some of the most faulted, thin seams in Britain. And this is my tribute to them. So, um, off we go um, on this gallop. Um, the, you know, there will be time for a few questions and stuff, and, and I'll give this talk to, to anybody who wants to listen. That is a group of miners coming off shift at Norton Hill in um, 1955. Um, they look pretty happy to come off shift, don't they? Um, but they look pretty healthy. Um, that's perhaps because Fred Swift, the Somerset Miners agent until 1945, led the world in ridding the mining industry um, or at least getting compensation for the dreaded disease of silicosis. So that historic court battle was largely led by Somerset miners and their trade union, the Somerset Miners Association. Um, and hopefully uh, those youngish miners coming off shift there, um, they look uh, pretty tasty, particularly the, the third guy from the left. I wouldn't like to, to tangle with him on the football field. Um, look pretty healthy, but um, I'll show you a slide in a minute, uh, which gives me the creep. So that's uh, Norton Hill. And before privatization, um, that was owned by a notorious um, mine owner called Frank Beecham. Now, how do I... Sorry, how do I... Uh, right, here we go. An astonishing number of coal mines in Somerset um, from about um, you know, 1700. An astonishing number. Uh, just look at that map. 79 pits uh, have been identified. And there was also a smaller coal field in another part of Somerset. And do you know this? A majority of waterborne and bad people, and I've lived here since 1987, do not know there was a Somerset coal field. The geology, uh, for those of you who are interested or have studied geology, uh, is that the Radstock pits were in the upper coal series um, of the Carboniferous um, period. Um, there was an upper, upper series, and as you can see in that top slide, a lower or Farrington seams. Farrington um, refers to Farrington Gurney, um, where a family called Rogers were miners for 200 years, and a dis, um, a, quite a close relative was Don Rogers, who uh, won the League Cup for Swindon, and Swindon's greatest ever player came from Barons and Gurney. And underneath that was the, the Pennant Sandstone. Uh, underneath the Pennant Sandstone was the Lower Coal series, um, but they weren't mined in Radstock. They were mined in the other part of the, uh, the Radstock area, which was Col Colford. And uh, we're going down to the lower slide there. And that... Um, that astonishing slide, if you can understand it, if you expect strata to be horizontal, 
those black dots are the lower series um, at Colford, at Bobster, um, at Edford, at Moorwood, uh, in the Nettlebridge Valley. Those of you who drive around that lovely valley now probably don't realise there were coal mines all down that valley, almost to Frum. Uh, there was a Mel's Colliery that was owned by Lady Horner of Little Jack Horner fame. But those seams aren't just verging towards the vertical, they're going over on top of each other. So the floor is the roof and the roof is the floor. And so Colford miners, Mel's miners, mined coal quite often like Cornish tin miners, vertically, not horizontally or on a slab. Astonishing, difficult conditions in that part of the coal field. Uh, and that's another slide um, showing um, you know, the vertical seams, the slanted seams in different parts of the Radstock area. And that's yours truly. Um, that's uh, Dave Chappell standing for Labour in the 1987 general election. <clears throat> and that street in Farrington Gurney, they hadn't had a Labour Party meeting for 20 odd years. That's the old Mills colliery tip there. Uh, and Chris Dando may contradict me, but I think that's a listed structure. It's the only uh, coal tip without um, fir trees covering it. Um, and, and that was the old mill Springfield tip. Um, and that Farrington Gurney council estate was 95% Labour voting, which is the highest percentage of anywhere in my constituency. This is a slide that gives me the creeps and try and compare it with the first one. That's Camerton colliery miners about to descend in 1900. And look at those tiny little boys. They are carrying their, their baits, their snack, their food with them, tugged around their necks, and that would be hung up to stop mice and rats um, um, gnawing at it. And the, the tiny little boy in the centre is carrying the notorious Gus and Crook, where in seams barely high enough for a young boy to crawl through for up to 70 yards there and back. He would work a seven and a half hour or in 1900 an eight hour day, pull in uh, a sledge um, called a cart. They were called carting boys. A carting boy at 25. These are boys that look to me to be about 10 or 11 or 12. Um, and those carts carry 200 weight of coal. And in a lot of cases, there weren't any proper runners, let alone rails. Um, they were dragging them along pretty uneven ground, and that uh, gives a shudder to me. This is from uh, perhaps the most amazing book written about the Somerset Coalfield. It's an autobiography by Jonathan Presto, published in 1880. It's a very rare little book, never been republished, and um, he's showing some of the arduous conditions. And he's actually got rails there, but in most cases there weren't any rails. And just think of the possibilities of terrible, if not fatal, accidents. If, for example, that young boy on uh, the, the dipple, the dipple is, is um, you know, a, a, a way that's going up, um, if he slipped, a uh, future cart of coal um, could drag the upper boy down. And similarly, um, on the lower slide, the possibilities of accidents. Uh, boys went barefooted. Why do you think they went barefooted? because they needed to grip the floor. But obviously the possibilities of amputated toes, crushed feet are massively, um, massively increased. And if you think I'm exaggerating, just look at Alfie Church there. Um, that's Alfie Church working a two foot scene. And what, a, what an amazing title for um, the finest autobiography we have um, of working conditions, Alfie Church. On the right at Newbury Colliery, and you see the kind of Cornish mining conditions there because of the difficult seams. And that lad is actually wearing a Gus and Crook, and that's thought to be the only photograph of the Gus and Crook um, at, uh, at work. The Gus and Crook was unique to Somerset. There was something slightly similar in the Forest of Dean. Um, and there's one of those strange illustrations below that. And I'm not quite sure if that's a very poor photograph that's retouched or some kind of a drawing. I think it's the former. Um, but um, A.J. Parfit, my life as a Somerset miner, if Alfie Church's um, autobiography is the most um, dramatic, so is A.J. Parfit's. A.J. Parfit's pamphlet, and you can get copies in the Radstock Museum, is written from the point of view of a passionate socialist. 
He was active in the Independent Labour Party. Although there were no explosions along the lines of South Wales or Durham or Lancashire, uh, St. Kenneth, just up from Caerphilly, uh, 440 men and boys were blown to smithereens in October 1913 in Britain's worst ever mining disaster. Uh, but this is uh, our uh, worst 20th century disaster. And these cards were quite often produced um, to raise funds uh, for the families. And there were rows between coal owners and the union about the amount of money that the union expected coal owners, this is way before nationalisation in 1947, should pay to the families. And the Bristol University has the minute books of the Norton Hill Disaster Fund um, and their amazing reading. And look at, the, uh, look at the ages and the faces of some of those small boys. And nobody, no owner or manager in the history of the Somerset Coalfield was ever censured, let alone prosecuted, let alone jailed for manslaughter or negligence. It was always accidental death, even though six people died in Timsbury in a coal dust um, accident in 1896. And in a government report, it was recommended that damping down of coal dust, which can spontaneously ignite, should happen in all Somerset coal mines. And that happened in 1908 in Norton Hill, and nobody was charged. I talked about accidents and disasters, and that's yours truly in 1987 as part of my campaign outside the Porton Memorial Hospital. Uh, much reduced services now. Chris Dando will know a lot more than me and, and Fluff and other Radstock people here. It's lost its maternity ward, but that hospital was built on the pennies of the Somerset Miners Association. Okay, Not Somerset Miners, that was the union that decided that they wanted a hospital and a hospital fund. And all people, all miners injured in Somerset, right up to closure in 1973, went to Paulton, and if it was serious, they went on to Bath Royal United Hospital. But thanks to say, uh, the Paulton Cottage Hospital is still there. This is the A37 going through Temple Cloud, and I'm sure some of you have driven down here on your way to Yeovil or whatever. And that's that amazing Gothic building next to the pub is the courthouse. And that was the uh, the Assizes, the County Council Court. And I didn't know this at all, but in the course of my researches into some of that minor history, I found out that, and this is nothing to do with wartime, this is nothing to do with emergency regulations, okay? That if the manager or the under manager felt that you had too much stone in your tub, okay? Or too much small coal or dust in the tub, okay? And there were no negotiations on this, or, and this happened quite often, if you're a proud coal hewer and a carting boy went sick and you were told to go carting again and put the dust and crook around you and go uh, naked apart from a pair of shorts crawling along small chambers and then your wages are reduced because coal hewers are paid on piecework and by the ton, you would not just be dismissed. You would not just be censored. If the manager had it in for you, you would end up in court for trying to keep the home fires burning and electricity and gas in that era. And, and so the whole um, records of the Somerset Assizes and County Court at Temple Cloud are of Somerset coal miners being dragged to court by their managers and fined when they'd already been dismissed for actually something that they could prove couldn't happen or victimization. Absolutely. Um, well, words fail me. That is an aerial view of Radstock. Um, I'm sorry it's kind of so so small. It, it, it would make a marvellous photograph at five times the size because then you could pick out individual buildings. But hopefully you can see the amazing sort of double pattern of the Somerset and Dorset railway tracks and the Great Western Railway tracks who both met in the centre of Radstock, and that's why it's such a traffic bottleneck today. Imagine the bottleneck when within 10 yards you had two double railway lines belonging to different companies up to nationalisation, um, which might close at the same time for the, for the Up Pines Express from Bournemouth to Bath uh, Green Park um, or the Bristol to Frum line. Um, and really that's an image I think which you, you, you might think um, fits any South Wales mining valley. 
Radstock at one time had at least um, a dozen pits uh, within 500 yards of the town centre. Uh, another picture of, of Radstock, um, middle pit is just behind the building in the lower right central. Uh, that used to be called the Waldegrave Arms, uh, and that's because Lord Waldegrave, um, William Waldegrave of Tewton Mendit was the last politician in the family. Um, I think he had some affair with a woman called Sarah, and that caused his trouble. Their ancestral home is still at Tewton Mendit, and Eleanor Jackson tells me, and, and Chris uh, can contradict me, that they still own a considerable portion of the ground rents in Radstock, including Radstock Primary School, um, you know, like 60 years after it's supposed to be, the mines were supposed to be nationalised. And Eleanor Jackson, Councillor Eleanor Jackson tells me that some records appertaining to Somerset mining are probably still um, rotting in one of um, Lord Waldegrave's garages in Tewton Mendit Manor. Um, this is a gallop, and it's also very much a, a, a kind of a random thing, and that's because of this method of, of using illustrations and having a presentation, which, uh, you know, isn't my style. I'd much rather give a handout, and then I could prepare it better. But that's the sink in a Pensford pit. Pensford pit was the last big uh, big pit to open in Somerset. It was the first pit to have uh, pit head baths. Um, the, it was quite a radical pit and its neighbour Bromley connected by a tramway. Uh, so if you go near Stanton Drew, idyllic North Somerset countryside um, along that B road from, from uh, Winford all the way down to, um, um, to near Pensford. And you wouldn't dream of thinking, if you weren't from the area, that Bromley pit and Pensford pit employed uh, nearly 800 men up to 1958. So that's the sink in a Pensford pit, pretty specialised and dangerous occupation. And a man who worked at Pensford Pits was Arthur Moon. And I knew Arthur Moon, which is why his picture is there. Uh, Arthur grew up in a socialist household in Simsbury. He was proud of the fact that Simsbury was a red village. He said nobody would ever dream of singing God Save the King in Simsbury, in or out of a pub. Um, he was a, a Labour councillor, a district councillor, um, and a local parish council chairman for decades. Uh, lovely guy. Um, in the 1930s, he was a staunch member of the Independent Labour Party. Um, his friends were, were communists, for them were miners, and he was proud of Timsbury's radical heritage. And he told me one terrible story, which has just been confirmed for me in the minutes that I'm uh, researching in Bristol University Library, where the union's marvellous records are that not in 1926 general strike, but after the 1921 lockout, which was also a bitter defeat for the miners of Great Britain, um, he was farmed out for six weeks to a middle-class family in Surrey uh, to avoid starvation. And that happened to about 50 Somerset children. I'm going to mention Daisy, Countess of Warwick, probably best known for being one of the many lovers of Edward VII when he was the Prince of Wales. But that's Greyfield Colliery, um, which was uh, next door to Clutton, uh, where Daisy Warwick came in because her husband owned Clutton Colliery. So this is next This is uh, next door to it, Greyfield Colliery in High Littleton. High Littleton still has, uh, I think, a, a cast iron Somerset signpost, one of those marvellous signposts, which directs you to Rudgebourne Farm. Anybody know the significance of Rudgebourne Farm? Well, Rudgebourne Farm, um, and uh, it's hard to heckle when you're muted, isn't it? Rudgebourne Farm was where British geology took off because the first person, William Smith, in about 1760 maybe, I might have got that date wrong, stayed at Rudgebourne, Rud, Rudgebourne Farm and went down the pits and discovered a momentous discovery which was you could correlate and name different rocks, coal seams, limestone, sandstone, across horizontal mileages, even up to 200 miles apart and even across the sea, judged by the age and type of the fossils in those rocks. And the science of geology was born in Somerset next to that pit greyfield. 
And there she is, Daisy Countess of Warwick, um, an extraordinary woman who was the belle of the ball, um, a debutante. Um, she came from aristocratic stock, was farmed off and married to the Earl of Warwick and lived in Warwick Castle on her wedding night. Any of you have been around Warwick Castle? But um, amongst the many other properties, the Earl of Warwick owned Clutton Colliery. Um, and in 1921, when it was threatened with closure, uh, Daisy Warwick, with her dalliance with King Edward VII, long gone, had become a fierce socialist. And she was notorious in aristocratic circles for being converted to socialism. That's her, her young son, Maynard, there. And you can still see Maynard Terrace, one of the Colliers Rows in Clutton. And Daisy became a passionate socialist left-wing socialist. She opposed the First World War. She was, um, if she didn't shag him, she was at least very friendly with Keir Hardy um, and Ramsay MacDonald and people like that. Um, her shagginets were perhaps over by then. Um, she was in her 50s. But she did her best to save that colliery, which her husband condemned the closure after a flood in 1921. An extraordinary woman and her Somerset story needs to be told. And this is one of the infamous um, vile bastards of Somerset coal mining history, uh, Frank Beecham, um, who was a vicious opponent of the union, a vicious opponent of dignity for miners, um, and Norton Hill was known as Beecham's gold mine. And in the 1920s, he bought all of the Watergrave pits. So up to nationalization, he controlled 95% of all the coal that came out of Bradstock. Um, he had uh, four manor houses within 10 miles of Bradstock. He could go from one to the other um, every night. Just have a read of Reg, Reg Jones's testimony there and have a look at that poor quality but extraordinary photograph behind the Watergrave Arms in the centre of Bradstock in 1926. Okay, everybody, I'd, I'd read of it. I don't believe for a minute that a Radstock miner, whether or not they lived in, uh, worked at Middle Pit, would want to blow their own workplace to smithereens. Um, I believe this was a put-up job. The gentleman surrounded by policemen on trestles, which were deliberately assembled for the photographer in a massive show of police force, right in the tiny town of Radstock, and that guy in the middle is Sir Frank Beecham with his own, as it were, private police force. And this cock and bull story, which has actually been reproduced. And, you know, at least Reg Jones, a miner for 40 years, says they reckon they found the bomb there. Um, and, you know, puts the other side of it. And yeah, I think Reg Jones is telling the truth. And besides that, look at the date. <laughs> November the 5th. So I think that was, um, and, you know, we like to think about conspiracies now. They're foremost in a lot of people's minds, aren't they? I think that was a police Frank Beecham conspiracy to try and get Middle Pit to be the first pit to have a scab. Um, and a scab did go in a, a week after that, but he was roughly handled and didn't go back again. And if you thought that picture was police intimidation, this, for my money, and I must have read 100 books on mining, is the most extraordinary photograph of British coal mining and, um, and uh, relationships with the union that I'm ever seen or ever likely to see. I haven't seen its like in Durham. I haven't seen its like in South Wales. Um, it's extraordinary. Um, that's um, um, that's um, Ernest Heppel, I believe with the bowler hat and greyhound. Um, and there are mounted police, there are police, there are scabs, there are strange looking police who look like Prussian military officers with um, bandanas around them. And look at this. Look at this. 20 or 30 scabs and police deliberately climbing up the headgear to be photographed in, a, in an amazing deliberate show of intimidation. And this photograph was taken in February 1909 after the so-called Dunkerton Colliery Riot, when Edgar Hill, a manager's son, 
felt that his father's house was about to be stoned. They lived in Carlingpot. Um, a whole load of miners went down singing Christmas carols and miners songs uh, because they were on strike. The Carton boys had been on strike for, for about four months. And he opened fire on them and injured them and hospitalized some of them. And the result, about three months later, in a court that wasn't held in Radstock, it wasn't held in Temple Cloud, it wasn't held in Bath, where was it held? It was held in Taunton, a million miles away from wherever anybody could afford to, even if they could get the day off, go by train or walk from Radstock to support Edgith and Kin. And Edgar Hill was found not guilty of manslaughter. And 13 to 20 miners, I can't remember the exact number, were given three to nine months hard labor in Shepton Mallet Jail. Um, and not one of them actually said that they'd thrown a single stone. And it was only Edgar Heal's testimony uh, and um, his um, housekeeper who said that stones were thrown. Um, they said every window in his house was smashed. And again, conspiratorially, the miner said he smashed the windows himself after he was shitting himself because he lived on unarmed miners. Going into uh, the Union, that's uh, Samuel Whitehouse, um, a staunch liberal, came down from the Midlands in 1888 to organise the Somerset Miners. And he certainly deserves a biography, as does Fred Gould. Uh, and I've just been reading to Glenn today Fred Gould's 1923 election address. Fred Gould wasn't a miner, but he was the champion of the miners. He was a Paulton boot and shoemaker, a radical trade unionist, a member of the ILP. And in 1923, thanks to the miners' vote, uh, and the vote of those um, women who were over 30, because women um, under 30 couldn't vote until 1929. In 1923, he became, with Walter Ailes of Bristol Central, the first Labour MP in the south of England. And Fred Gould was very, very active in his union until the day he died. This is uh, Fred Swift, uh, who was the miner's agent, started off as a casting boy in Rhythmington, and there must be 30 Swifts um, you know, there, there, are, there are names that keep coming back and back and back in my researches. Um, and one family are the Swifts of uh, Rithlington uh, and Wellow and Shoscombe, an amazing place um, where the Somerset and Dorset Railway weaved its way to Bath. Fred was the miners' agent um, from 1917 to 1945, and he was also chairman, as it was called in those days, of the Frum Divisional Labour Party for 30 years. And that's A.J. Parfit, um, the radical socialist, more left-wing than Fred, um, never even became, as far as I'm aware, um, he was never voted in as a pit representative. Uh, but his little pamphlet, My Life as a Somerset Miner, is a minor masterpiece. And this may surprise some of you who maybe didn't even know much about Radstock. There was a flourishing coalfield in Nailsey. And those of you who travel by train, uh, those of you who travel by train to, to Bristol along that route, um, when you get to Backhorse Station, just ease out of nails in Backhorse Station. Two little pumps by trees are there within a few hundred yards of you on, on the north side, and they are colliery tips. The last pit shut in about 1890. Uh, very, very little is known about the Nailsy coal mines. I haven't come across a single mention of a trade union. I haven't come across a single mention of a strike or a riot. Nailsy coal mines and their miners await their historian. If anybody can help me out, um, please let me know. And uh, why was Nailsy coal uh, up, certainly up to about the 1820s, 1830s, when this huge operation shut? It supplied coke and coal for the Nailsy Glassworks, which is one of the biggest factories in the southwest of England. Um, I think maybe next to Fox's, um, um, uh, what you call it, hosiery, which is the biggest factory outside of Bristol up to about 1820. And it was this factory uh, producing uh, all sorts of glass, some of it is collectible now, um, that Hannah Moore paid a visit. Uh, Hannah Moore, the notorious uh, hypocrite, uh, who wanted to educate um, people in uh, the, the children of Nailsy and the Mendips, but only so far as they could learn to obey their betters. Uh, and the only book she actually used was the Bible or her version of Bible stories. 
And when she visited uh, Nailsey, she visited the homes of the glass workers. And do you know what she was horrified by? Not their poor conditions or, the, or their need for more room, because most Nailsey glass workers uh, had big families. She was horrified by the amount of beef and mutton and stew and cider and beer they were consuming because of their high wages, which disgusted her. This is the most, uh, for my money, uh, Chris Stando, uh, again, be able to tell me. I do hope these these cottages are listed. This, uh, These are the Lower Whitelands Rose, below Tiny Pit, which is covered by pines up there. For me, the most extraordinary workers' housing in the southwest of England. Uh, and there were originally an, an Upper Whitelands as well that was demolished at some time. They're extraordinary. Um, they have the most enormously long, um, thin gardens, which I know as, as long as two football pitches, some of them, uh, which shows the passion of the miners and their families for feeding themselves. Um, and if you walk up a very steep Tining Hill from the Watergrave Arms um, and go across the site of Tining Colliery, you will see that most extraordinary workers' housing. And if William Watergrave was happy to evict, evict strikers or evict socialists, or evict cooperators from the many dwellings he built, because he built most of Radstock. His houses were sound, um, and um, uh, you know, I just think that's uh, extraordinary workers' housing. <coughs> this is uh, what's become a bit of an iconic, iconic image um, of the Somerset coalfield as a countryside coalfield. This is Riddlington Colliery. Uh, those railway lines, that's the Somerset and Dorset Railway, just a mile and a half out of Bradstock, and that's now a cycle path to Bath. Um, so this is uh, my last slide, um, and um, there's Chris Dando, a very young um, Chris Dando there, um, just to the right as we look at it, Betty Perry. The moon is there, second left. Ian White, um, parliamentary candidate for Radstock and a Euro MP, and, and a lovely guy. Um, the only solicitor I ever met with a genuine person, um, and I think Ian is still around. And there are lots of, of other people there. Uh, Dan Norris in the middle there, uh, currently Metro Mayor. Uh, Phil Gregory, former Secretary of the South West TUC. Uh, Jeff Collard, uh, full-time officer for the NGA during the Purnells dispute, uh, and the one and only Terry Reeks, a lifelong socialist, lives at Frimmel in Radstock, um, shop steward for Standard Czech Paper Bag Company, um, fantastic socialist, and he came to our first ever Trades Council meeting in Radstock. So, um, you yeah, that, know, that's, that's where we are, and just a, a few sort of comments um, to, to finish. The Somerset uh, coalfield was always a coalfield. <laughs> it never employed more than 6,000 men. Um, union organization was very, very difficult. <coughs> Excuse me. <laughs> Particularly in the coal, in the uh, coalfield area, <coughs> and that's uh, Edford Colliery, Moore Colliery, Boster. Uh, Newbury uh, and Mel's Colliery. Mel's Colliery wasn't actually in the village of Mel's, but it was owned by Lady Horner um, and uh, her uh, right-hand man called Sir William Haldane. And at times when Lady Horner was trying to close the colliery because she felt it was bleeding money, uh, mm -hmm. nobody had the temerity to ask her how much uh, her own personal fortune was. Uh, th sometimes the miners and Fred Swift would negotiate directly um, with Lady Horner herself. And um, almost unbelievably, and I think this says something about the disunity and the difficulties the Somerset Miners Association had in bringing everybody together, even in such quite a compact area, certainly compared to South Wales, was that for 50, 60 years, for 50 or 60 years, um, the, uh, the Colford district had lower wages um, than the rest of the Radstock area uh, and they were subjected to different agreements 
um, and it took a hell of a long time, only just before nationalisation, I think in the 1930s when that was sorted out. Um, you know, what were the what were the wages? Well, um, after the 1921 lockout, briefly after the First World War, wages for hewers might have gone up to three or even four pounds a week. But after the 1921 lockout, um, you know, longer hours, um, sh uh, lower pay, right down sometimes to two pound a week, um, sometimes less than that. If you were and surface workers were hard to organise as well. Nationalisation came along, and the 13 pits of nationalisation. One of them was a workers' co-op, and I haven't mentioned that. You know, this is a kind of a three-hour talk for those stalwarts who might be interested in uh, propping your eyelids open. But Farnborough uh, was closed in uh, 1920, and they moved across the road to somewhere called Marsh Lane. Um, which is just on the, on that, I can't remember the name of it now, but that steep hill that climbs up to the Mendips on the A37 outside of Parrington. And there's a little diagonal lane there that goes down to the Radstock Road, and that's where Marsh Lane Cooperative was. And for many, many years, the Somerset Miners Association found it difficult to admit any of the Farrington miners, uh, because although, um, you know, they, they were basically socialist okay. workers cooperative enterprise, they were classed as self-employed, and the Somerset Miners Association oh, wouldn't approve them. Can everybody and, mute, please? Sorry, Dave, I'm hearing sounds. Parrington only uh, lasted a couple of years, and another extraordinary, it was, this was a drift mine, it was in Charmborough, which is on the hills just above Holcombe, so if you go, again, along the A37, or the Foss Way, actually, um, and go through Stratton on the Foss, you are within um, sighting distance of two or three coal mines, one of which was the Chamber Drift, um, that only employed about uh, 30 or 35 men, and the other was New Rock Colliery, which lasted until 1968. So 13 collieries at nationalisation, um, they gradually shut um, as um, the seams were felt to be uh, too small, too uneconomic. A good seam in Somerset was two and a half feet. Managers, certainly in the 19th century and up to the 1920s, would expect a hewer, a proud hewer, who maybe earns three or four pounds a week on a good seam, and a good seam in Somerset, like I said, three foot was almost unheard of, would be asked to work a nine-inch seam. And if you go back to that image of Alfie Church crouched in that position, his shoulders are almost wedged from the top or bottom of the seam having to, to horizontally wield that pick for seven hours, um, you know, you'll see the Somerset conditions. So gradually uh, they closed uh, Pensford and Bromley in 1958, Old Mills and Springfield in 1966, um, Norton Hill in 65, uh, Norton Hill in 66, New Rock Colliery, where Michael Evis of Glastonbury Festival fame, um, when he was a young lad of 19, spent three months working at New Rock. Um, he... I think he cycled for the first week and then he got himself a scooter uh, to zoom up the minutes and work at New Rock. Um, and Michael Levis says that he actually saw his mate killed by a falling rock. Um, and this is in about 1960 in front of him. And after three months, Michael called it a day. Uh, and like I said, um, fairly near the beginning, um, the era ended in 1973, September, when Rivington and Kilmerston, which were joined underground, um, and linked by a tortuous railway system, which kind of um, the engine had to reverse and then it would go along the Great Western Railway because the Somerset and Dorset um, was almost shut. Um, that wasn't quite the end. Why wasn't it quite the end? Because in 1984, uh, South Wales miners started to picket Rivlington Colliery Tip because a uh, an unscrupulous Thatcherite builder, Chris Dando might know his name, decided it was economic to scrape bits of coal, demolish all the lovely fir trees, get coal out of Rivington tip. Um, and I'm not quite sure how that ended, but I do know that South Wales miners picketed uh, Rivington tip. So it's nearly um, eight o'clock, um, which was my 40 minutes, 45 minutes. Um, I galloped through um, the, you know, the, the Somerset uh, mining history. A hell of a lot of people will say, well, why bother? Well, for me, um, we should never forget the conditions in which Somerset miners worked. They were almost certainly, perhaps with the Forrester Dean, 
the most cramped um, and dangerous um, because of the cramped conditions uh, mines in the United Kingdom. Um, they provided Somerset uh, Bath in particular, uh, Wells, Glastonbury, from Westbury, Swindon, uh, with most of their coal for 200 years. Uh, Bridgewater and Taunton were supplied with coal by the Great Western Railway through Bridgewater Docks. Bristol had its own coal field. And for the last 15 years, Somerset survived on Watts Plant. Portishead Power Station. And when Portishead Power Station converted to oil in 1971, that was the death knell of the Somerset coal field. But I'd like to end just on a political note because the first ever Somerset Labour councillor uh, was elected to the Somerset County Council in 1909. His name was Fred Holvey, and a whole succession, um, I think right up to the 1960s, there was always a Somerset County Councillor, um, sorry, up to 1974, there was always a Somerset Labour Councillor from Radstock, and they included some amazing characters, like the Reverend Geoffrey Ramsey, who was an Anglican vicar um, of Rhythmington, deserves a biography, a major figure. He was the president of the United Kingdom Cooperative Union, that's the modern cooperative party, and there's a lovely photograph of him in the Methodist Central Hall in Bristol, speaking to 2,000 delegates when he was president of the Cooperative Congress in 1921. Uh, he was a high Anglican, almost an Anglo Catholic, and a passionate, fierce defender of the miners and a fierce socialist. So, um, you know, it's for it's for the socialists, uh, the cooperators, um, the women who supported their men folk through through uh, thick and thin, uh, some of whom were involved in some of the riots previous to the founding of the union, which I haven't got time to go into, but before the miners' union, there was 150 years of rioting. Uh, and if the genteel Bath residents of Bo Nash's time um, were ever to sleep unsound in their beds, it was because a rumour had spread into the Royal Crescent and the circus and Bo Nash's mansion that the Somerset miners were angry and they had a banner, bread or blood, and they were walking up Dunkerton Hill across Peasdown to invade their lovely city of Bath. Thank you very much.